Hi there, my name is Ben Seri. I'm the VP of Research at Armis, and today with me I have uh, Barak Haddad. Hi. Barak is a researcher on my team. Today we're going to talk about CDPON. CDPON is a set of RSE vulnerabilities that we've discovered in Cisco's CDP protocol, uh, and these affect a wide array of Cisco's devices, switches, routers, but also IP phones and IP cameras. An estimated tens of millions of devices were affected by these, these vulnerabilities. Uh, they can be used to break network segmentation, but also take over enterprise IoT devices such as IP phones and IP cameras. We'll get to how this can be done in a minute, but first let me tell you a bit about ourselves. The company we both work at, Armis, is an enterprise IoT security company. And that mean, means that we deal with IoT devices and unmanaged devices in various environments, in corporates, in medical facilities, and also in manufacturing. Part of our job is to study and research the infrastructure that is there to limit devices to a defined segment. So this research set out to discover the risks to network infrastructure that may enable an unmanaged device to target it and break network segmentation, gaining access to more critical parts of the network. Right, so this is our agenda for this talk. Uh, we'll begin with what is CDPON. What did we actually find, the severity of the vulnerabilities, and which devices they affect? Then we're going to discuss the history of VLAN hopping. Um, as I mentioned, part of why we looked at this in the first place is to understand network segmentation better, to, un to understand whether it's secure and whether we can poke holes in it. So we want to cover the history of VLAN hopping techniques. How are attackers doing this? What are the known techniques? And what CDPON adds to the equation? Then we'll, we'll discuss the attack surface of proprietary layer 2 protocols that constitute a large attack surface in network appliances. CDP is one example of a proprietary layer 2 protocol from Cisco that is used by almost every device that Cisco manufactures, but there are actually additional protocols. This research started from looking in vulnerabilities that were already patched, what is called one days, and analyzing uh, the patches for, for them. We looked at Cisco disclosures in various layer 2 protocols um, understood the underlying bugs that were fixed and from there continued the research and found new vulnerabilities. Although the affected devices are embedded devices that use very little mitigation, ASLR is in use and so overcoming it when exploiting these RCs was not trivial and we will discuss a technique we developed to bypass ASLR that is a very effective for these vulnerabilities uh, that we call polyrop. We'll end with some takeaways on the implication of this research to the security of networks and enterprise grade IP phones and IP cameras and show a demo on how we managed to exploit the RCs on the affected devices. So to begin in high level, what is CDPON? It is five vulnerabilities, uh, four remote code execution vulnerabilities and one denial of service vulnerability. It is, the, it is in the implementation of Cisco's CDP protocol and it affects a wide range of Cisco's devices, like I said, switches, routers, IP phones and IP cameras and an estimate number of around tens of millions of devices affected. All these devices here were affected, from Nexus switches, which are the newest line of Cisco switches, to Cisco IRS XR routers, Cisco Firepower firewalls, and the entire line of current Cisco IP phones, and this um, 8,000 series of Cisco IP cameras. These devices are used everywhere, and the I Cisco IP phones specifically are the most prevalent IP phones in the market. Cisco advertises that 95% of Fortune 500 companies use their IP phone solutions. And in fact, they are used by uh, the government, in corporates, uh, in the White House specifically, you can, you can find them um, in the Situation Room, on the Resolute Desk, and throughout the White House staff rooms. Um, yeah, so yes, they are really prevalent, but they are actually not the main focus of this research. As I mentioned, our initial goal was to see how VLAN hopping was done in the past and whether it can still be achieved today using additional vulnerabilities. So, so to understand VLAN hopping techniques, let's discuss for a minute VLANs and how network segments um, work. This is a simple design of a network diagram and the best practice of how networks need to be connected today. You will separate your devices based on trust level and type of device. So you might have one segment for low-grade IoT devices that you don't trust at all. They connect to the internet, but you really don't want them interacting with anything on your network. 
And then you'd have a corporate segment for, for uh, all your corporate assets, your, computer, your computers, and, uh, and, and whatnot. And so your network would be split according to these segments in order to prevent devices from low level trust talking to devices with high level trust. So if an attacker were to compromise a device inside the IoT segment, for example, he could interact with other IoT devices, but he can't, by design, talk with devices in the corporate network or other parts of the network, for that matter. So this is the power of network segmentation, why it should be used. And what are the techniques uh, that existed in the past or maybe still exist today uh, that can challenge this, this uh, strategy? Uh, double VLAN tagging is a very old technique. In certain circumstances, it still works today. It takes advantage of a simple flaw in how VLANs work. Each network has what is called a native VLAN, and it is the idea of the VLAN of any traffic that doesn't have a VLAN header. The native VLAN number one is a special case of native VLAN, in which untagged traffic in a trunk port is considered to be um, in VLAN number one in the native VLAN. Um, unfortunately, native VLAN number one is the default native VLAN. And so in a normal network, when you have an attacker connected to a switch through an access port in the native VLAN, uh, he can send packets without a VLAN header. And then in the trunk port between the switches, the packets will also be without any VLAN header. The switch also supports decapsulating a VLAN header from an access port if the used VLAN ID is the native VLAN of the network, number one, for example. So the double VLAN tagging attack simply works by an attacker putting two VLAN headers on packets, the outer one on an AT VLAN, and then the inner one, uh, a target VLAN ID he'd like to be routed to. The switch will decapsulate the outer header, and on, uh, and on, on the trunk port, the packet will contain the target VLAN. So this is a very simple technique. It works, but it has limitations. So first of all, you can only send packets one way. You can't receive packets back from the target VLAN. It's also very simple to fix this. Cisco recommends customers not to use native VLAN number, num number one, and then this problem doesn't exist. But in certain cases, when switch configurations are not ideal, this can still occur. A second logical flaw to do VLAN hopping is by abusing DTP. DTP is a Cisco priority protocol called the dynamic trunking protocol. This protocol is a simple one. It's just there to enable the automatic con configuration of switch ports. Ports of a switch will either be in access mode or trunk mode. But DTP enables the port to, to change its mode dynamically from an access mode to trunk mode um, by negotiating over DTP packets. So if DTP is not turned off, an attacker can simply send a DTP packet to the switch that says to the switch, change the mode of my port from access port to trunk port. Once the, once the port is in trunk mode, the attacker can natively send and receive packets from any VLAN. So this, this just abuses a feature in Cisco switches that allows switch or devices to change their ports mode from access trunk, to, from access port to trunk port. And here, a very simple solution from Cisco is to turn off DTP, at least on any port that is connected to a non-trusted device. Okay, so what happens if DTP and double VLAN tagging can't be used? What can attackers still do? They can look for vulnerabilities in whatever layer two protocols are parsed by the code inside uh, the switch, even in access ports. And CDPON is exactly this, vulnerabilities in this exact attack surface. If an attacker has something like CDPON, how would he use it? So let's take this for example. He ha uh, an attacker has gained control over an IoT device in the IoT segment. He can send maliciously crafted CDP packets that will be parsed by the core switch. And if a vulnerability exists there, that might, that might lead him to code execution on the core switch. And from the switch, he obviously, he obviously has access to the entire network, including all of its VLANs. A core switch is a very strong position for an attacker to control. He can exfiltrate data from the switch, he can listen in on any network traffic that traverses through the switch, and he can carry out man-in-the-middle attacks. So other than VLAN hopping, which is where we started, it is important to understand that attacking a switch can be a gold mine of its own to attackers. As I mentioned uh, before, um, DTP is a layer two protocol um, that is used, that had these uh, logical flaws that allow you to move from an access port to a trunk port. But there are actually many more of these layer two protocols that are used by network appliances. 
by switches and routers. The orange ones here are Cisco proprietary protocols. But Cisco is uh, the de facto standard in network appliances. So an attacker can consider all of these protocols as a potential attack surface for him to try and poke at. Okay, so now uh, Barak will talk uh, about uh, the research that we've done uh, uh, analyzing uh, Cisco security advisories in layer two protocols and how this led us eventually uh, to the vulnerability that we've discovered. So we wanted to find the most vulnerable parts of the layer two attack surface. So we started by looking at one days from Cisco's website. Both of these advisories uh, seemed like they could uh, lead to some remote code execution. Both of these advisories are about discovery protocols. Both of the protocols are enabled by default and terminated by the nearest switch. Uh, CDP and NDP are discovery protocols. The main functionality is for devices to find one another in the network. They work by devices simply, simply sending advertisement packets to a designated MAC address. Every device that listens to these adv advertisement packets records them and will not forward them down the line. CDP, the Cisco Discovery Protocol, supports some advanced features like a VoIP uh, dedicated VLAN and power over Ethernet negotiation, which allows the VoIP phones to request specific power requir requirements from the switch. That's why Cisco VoIP phones don't have a CDP shutdown function. It will hurt the functionality of the device. We saw this LLDP one day in a Cisco security advisory and thought we may be able to exploit it. Um, and the only technical data was that the vulnerability exists due to improper error handling of malformed LLDP messages. Not much, not much to start from, so we compared the firmware before and after the patch and looked for changes in the LLDP parsing functions. We used the Yafora as a diffing tool one of its handy features is the comparison of branches, if statements, between matching functions. The LLDP process TLV function changed quite a bit. In green, you can see the changes. The function uses a switch case to parse each TLV. TLV is a type length value structure, and for each TLV, there are different length restrictions. As you can see, there, are, there were many missing length checks. We could easily develop a denial of service attack using this, but we were unable to make a remote code execution out of it, so we continued our research to CDP. DCVE says the vulnerability exists because of insufficiently validated CDP packet headers. Just like with the LLDP one day, there is not much information in DCVE, but they do say that it's a buffer overflow and that it could allow arbitrary code execution. So let's examine the CDP protocol. Looking at the addresses TLV, we see there are a lot of lengths and some of them doesn't even make sense. The TLV length is two bytes, but the number of addresses is a four byte field. Besides that, we have two more length fields for each address. Great for vulnerability research. We tried overflowing each length and the device didn't crash. So we took a look at the actual code. We found an interesting state confusion that leads to a memory corruption by sending a legitimate packet and a malicious one right after it. On the right, you can see the code that handles this, this field. It tries to make sure that the address length matches the protocol type, so that IPv4 will have a four byte address and IPv6 will have a 16 byte address. An address blob is allocated for each device when the first CDP packet arrives, and it is being updated for every new CDP packet. Address length and protocol type are attacker controlled. So the first packet is a legitimate IPv4 one. It sets the protocol type in the address blob to IPv4 and the address LAN to 4. On the next packet, the attacker sets the protocol type to an invalid value, neither IPv4 nor IPv6, and sets the length to max unsigned short. Um, since the protocol type is invalid, both if statements in the beginning of the function are not taken, and the protocol type stays IPv4. Next, uh, it, and it's the one from the previous packet. Next, uh, when we get to the last if statement, we now get to copy as much as we want uh, to the address blob, which is only 32 bytes long. We are now convinced that CDP is a good target and that boundary checks are uh, an issue in this parcel. Zero days are closer than ever. So it's time to CDP on all the things. So this first uh, zero day we're going to talk about is actually in the same TLV as the previous one day. Uh, it impacts a wide, a wide variety of Cisco switches and routers, 
as you will shortly see, it deals with faulty length checks, specifically the number of addresses, which is a four byte long uh, uh, length. That's weird because the TLV length is represented with, two, with only two bytes, so it's impossible to fit that amount of addresses in the CDP packet. In the next few slides, we will show, we will see how different code bases struggled with these multiple length fields. The first vulnerable code base is the one found in the iOS XR based product, which, ma which mainly includes routers. Notice that there is a malloc with a user controlled size. There is also a length check, but the size that is checked is not the one that is being allocated. And both are vulnerable to classic integer overflows. If we can find a number that will overflow to a, to a small number in the first check and a large number uh, when the allocation occurred, occurs, uh, we can exhaust the device's memory. Let's take max unsigned int divided by 5 rounded up. After the multiplication and overflow, we end up with a small size, bypassing the length check. But uh, we end up trying to allocate 3 gigabytes, causing the malloc to fail instead of a denial of service. Now we'll try to take the same size, but times 4, causing another overflow in the allocation size. We still get a small enough size for the length. And now we're trying to allocate only 820 megabytes. And the allocation succeeds. Do that a few times, and the device crashes. Send these packets every 10 seconds, and you put the router in a boot loop. The next code base is the one of NXOS. That code is used in many of Cisco switches, and specifically the Nexus series. NXOS is Linux based. And the chosen parsing implement implementation is a one where each protocol parser has its own process. In this code base, the second if will allocate the new value if it's bigger than the old value, so we can just ignore it. And the first if looks like some kind of overflow check, but faulty one. Multiplying number of addresses by 32 is the same as shifting the value by five bits left. So uh, to pass the first if statement, we just need the first uh, five bits to be smaller than the next five ones. Using this, an attacker can allocate any number of bytes and easily crash the CDP process. On NXOS, the CDP process is restarted uh, when it crashes, but if there are more than three crashes in the same five minutes, the entire switch reboots. An attacker could boot loop the device by broadcasting CDP messages every couple of seconds. The next zero day we'll talk about affects the same NXOS based devices. It is in the power request TLV, and it is a simple stack overflow. Funny to, to mention, this bug works even if the switch has no PoE, power over Ethernet, uh, support because the passing code is still there. We successfully exploited this zero day due to no stack anaries and low entropy ASLR. We will talk about how we bypassed uh, the ASLR in a minute. Besides the stack overflow, there is a right what where primitive, which we will also demonstrate. OK. So temp is a stack buffer of fixed length. The while loop copies data from the CDP packet to that buffer with no length checks whatsoever. Besides that, A1 is also a pointer on the stack, and the payload is written to an offset of it. So uh, when we overwrite A1, we get a write what where primitive as well. It means we have both a stack overflow and a write what where primitive in the same exploit packet. Let's see how we can leverage that. Before digging in, let's explore the mitigations. Uh, the only mitigation in these devices are NX bit and 32 bit ASLR, since the CDP process is a 32 bit process. For 32 bit Linux, ASLR is randomizing just one byte uh, of the address, and it's not the most significant one. So the distance between two adjacent ASLR options is only four kilobytes. Multiply that by the number of options, 256 and you get one megabyte top distance between two ASLR options. It means that if some code section is bigger than one megabyte, an attacker can choose an address that is guaranteed to have some code in it for any ASLR option. Besides that, the entire memory map has the same ASLR shift, and shared objects are only four kilobytes apart, which also helps dealing with ASLR. We dub the term polyrop for the technique of ASLR-based switch case. Uh, the concept is to find one absolute address that triggers different ROP gadgets based on the current ASLR option and build a ROP chain that works for more than one ASLR option without the need for infolix. 
Using this, we can shorten the ASLR brute force time and exploit the device in minutes instead of days. The hardest part was to find, uh, to find in this polyrop chain is the multi-gadget, an address that triggers a different gadget for every ASLR option. We are going to demonstrate a multi-gadget that works for three ASLR options. Uh, in green, you can see we highlighted the byte that ASLR shifts. As you can see, the addresses are the same except for that byte, so we can put one of these addresses and let ASLR choose the proper gadget for us. Here is another representation. Every column represents represent the memory space of one ASLR option, and the multi-gadget is the address uh, we're going to jump to at the beginning of our ROP chain. You can see that in ASLR option 1, the multi-gadget address triggers gadget A. In ASLR option 2, it triggers gadget B, and in ASLR option 3, it triggers gadget C. So let's take the three addresses and check the, the hypothesis with actual numbers. For ASLR option 0, the addresses stay the same. For ASLR option 8, the addresses are shifted, and now another gadget falls on address 6F314. For ASLR option 45, the addresses are shifted again, and another gadget is moved to the same 6F address. And bingo. By jumping to address 6F314, we are guaranteed that one of the gadgets will be activated. Each row shows the location of the gadgets for a specific ASLR option, and you can see that each row has some gadget in the address 6F314. Looking back at these gadgets, gadget A pops and returns, gadget B pops and returns, and uh, double pops and returns, and gadget C gets 32 bytes off the stack and returns. That means that for every ASLR option, the ROP chain is pivoted, in, pivoted into a different address. Looking at the uh, ROP chain flow, the multi-gadget acts as a switch case and splits the ROP chain to an individual ROP chain for each ASLR option. In order to have enough space for each ASLR option, we needed to space out the ROP chains. For this purpose, we use stack keeping, gadget, stack keeping gadgets. Stack keeping gadgets are gadgets that add to the stack pointer, but don't write to uh, the process memory. Using stack keeping gadgets, we can give each ROP chain enough space to restore execution and execute our shellcode. So we just need to find some stack keepers. Just a second, okay. Um, these are a few stack keeper examples. The only, uh, change they only change registers and the stack address, but don't touch any actual memory. The first one on the left pops 244 bytes and returns. The second one, 36, and the last one, 640. We are no longer limited by SLR, so we made a script that automatically finds uh, stack skipping gadgets and found these. Every line in this dictionary maps uh, between a skipping length and a ROP gadget address. So a quick re recap, the multi-gadget splits the ROP to multiple paths because it triggers a different gadget for every SLR option. The stack skippers space out the ROP chains so that they have enough space for the shellcode, and now we just need to write the shellcode as if there is no SLR and relocate the addresses for every SLR option ROP chain. Using this method, we were able to make one ROP chain that works for uh, 15 ASLR options, including execution restoration. This reduced the exploitation time from about seven hours to uh, half an hour and was a lot of fun to develop. In the picture, you can see a remote uh, root shell that we were able to trigger using this exploitation. So now we'll demonstrate uh, this uh, code uh, exploitation by takeover a Cisco Nexus switch. Uh, on the right, you see a laptop on the network, the internal network, uh, and uh, the Cisco switch on the bottom, and on the left, you can see the hacker terminal. And now he tries to get the secret data, and he can't because he's not in the correct villain. So he sniffs the CDP packets, and uh, inside the CDP packets, he knows, uh, you see the data from which port is connected to the switch. So now he can change uh, settings for his own port when he gets code execution. Now the attacker starts the attack, sends the payload until he gets an ASLR bypass, successfully executed, uh, and now he adds a user to the switch and adds a management IP for the switch in the same VLAN as the VLAN is currently connected to. 
and connect the switch. Okay, so now it is connected to the switch, you can execute uh, a wood shell and uh, do whatever you want, so he checks the villains. And he sees he's connected to the guest villain and the uh, IT network is on this super secret villain. So he just changes the villain of the attacker to the one of the um, super secret villain. And when he's connected to the super secret villain, he can get the secret data and exfiltrate it out. So the last zero day we will talk about uh, affects multiple models of Cisco VoIP phones. It is also a simple stack overflow using a mem copy with no length validation. Uh, like NXOS, the CDP parsing process runs with root privileges, meaning that an attacker gains full control over the device after exploiting this vulnerability. As mentioned before, CDP is sent with a special multicast MAC address. Assuming it's all Cisco switches, when a CDP packet is being sent correctly, it is parsed in the neighbor switch, and it's not being forward. The switch discards it, because uh, it uh, assumes the uh, packet is destined for the switch. When a malformed packet, uh, one with an incorrect MAC address is being sent, the neighboring switch will pass it on, since it's not being identified as a CDP packet. If a packet is sent with a unicast or bro broadcast address, it will be forwarded but not passed by the switch at all uh, on the way to the target. We found another bug in this line of uh, VoIP phones. It doesn't check the MAC address when it parses CDP packets, meaning that the malformed packet will be parsed as if it was a legitimate one. This expands uh, the possible attack target to all of the Cisco VoIP phones in the current plan. To demonstrate this bug, we can take a look at this graph showing the flow of a CDP packet inside the VoIP phone. The main things to look, at, to look at are the red part, which is the function containing the stack overflow vulnerability, and the green part, which is the function in charge of packet validation. Here is the function that validates the CDP packet. As we can see, the only validation of the Ethernet header is of the source MAC address and not the destination MAC. This means that any destination MAC can be used, including unicast and broadcast. Once again, this enables the attacker to attack any target in his, in his local LAN. As we've said, these VoIPs can be found in important places. Let's take a closer look at the exploitation process. This IP phone runs a Linux system with BusyBox on a 32-bit ARM processor. It has ASLR and NX bit on. As we've seen before, Linux 32-bit ASLR randomizes only one byte with the top memory distance of one megabyte between two ASLR options. We will try PolyROP for this R32 exploit, but there are a few differences we need to consider. First, the addresses in ARM are aligned. It means that we can choose an address that will give a valid opcode for all ASLR options. Second, in ARM, we also have uh, the thumb mode as another alignment option. If we look back at our x86 uh, exploit, the addresses are unaligned, so we may not have a valid code for every SLR option, but we have more addresses to choose from. In general, it sounds like polyrop should be easier for this uh, architecture, architecture. Our first attempt at ARM32 polyrop is all about branching. Looking at the epilogue of the vulnerable function, we see that the function ends with a, a pop of registers, the stack pointer and the PC. This is actually very bad since the stack is also ASLR, meaning we can execute only one ROP gadget because we don't know where the stack is. But what can we do with just one ROP gadget? We thought of this idea. We use that one gadget to branch to a register, hopefully a different register for every ASLR option. Since we also overwrite the stack pointer, the address we are going to branch to is the start function of the parsing thread, essentially restarting the current thread, but this time with a known stack address. Now that we know the stack address, we can resend the exploit, but this time with a longer polyrope, since the stack address is known. We found this branching multi-gadget. 
Same as before, the only difference between these gadgets, uh, these gadget, gadget addresses is the byte that ASLR randomizes. But each gadget branches to a different register, making a great multi-gadget. The first gadget bran branches to register 7, the second one to register 4, and the third one to register 12. To sound this polyrop attempt, we use the multi-gadget to branch to register, a different register for each ASLR option. The function we branch to is the thread start function, and stack address is shifted to an absolute address. Now that we know the stack address, we send another packet with a full polyrop chain. The main flaw of this method is that we are limited by the amount of popped registers, and in reality, we found an exploit that works only for five unique options. Hence, polyrop ARM32 version 2. This time, we use the same CVE, but don't overwrite the stack pointer or the PC. We found that just by overwriting the registers with the correct values, we get a relative write what were uh, primitive. And in the wise words of Sar Amar, some people say that all you need is love. This is a lie. All you need is a relative read-write primitive. We're going to use the relative write in order to uh, spray stack pivots. That's not a stack spray. We're literally going to spray stacks. After we spray uh, our relative stacks, we will jump to an absolute address and let ASLR choose the correct stack for us. We're going to explain this in more detail. OK, each column in this slide illustrates the memory space of the CDP process for a specific ASLR option. And the three, op the three options are four kilobytes apart. In orange, we have the absolute address of our new stack. That's where we want our, our, our ROP chain to be. We use the relative write primitive to write the ROP chain for ASLR option 1. For ASLR option 1, it falls right on the address of the new stack. For ASLR option 2, it's 4 kilobytes away. And for SLR option 3, it's 8 kilobytes away. So we use the relative write to write the ROP chain of SLR option 2. Since it's relative, the ROP chain for SLR option 1 is untouched. And now option 2 has the correct SLR option in the correct place. We use the relative write again, this time writing the ROP chain for SLR option 3. Now, all we need to do is to overwrite the stack uh, with the absolute address of the new stack. That's the orange line. And let ASLR choose the correct drop chain for us. To sum this up, we now have an exploit that works for all ASLR options, without crashing the device even once. We just send 256 packets uh, that write the relative drop chains, one for each ASLR option, and one packet that pivots the stack. Since this can be sent over multicast, an attacker can use this to sit upon all Cisco VoIPs uh, on the network in just one go. We would like to mention that this polyrop technique works for any exploitation of 32-bit ASLR uh, when the attacker has a relative write and a stack pivot primitive, so we made a write paper for the specific technique. Uh, and now I will pass the, pre the presentation to Ben, who will show some demos of this exploitation. OK, so uh, as Borak mentioned, we managed to exploit this uh, with, with the bypass of the SLR, um, and we're going to show a demo of this. But first, uh, when we come to exploiting a VoIP phone, uh, we need to think what can we do with a VoIP phone. And obviously, uh, first of all, uh, it's a phone, so it contains audio uh, of, of calls, but uh, it also has a screen and it has a keypad. So naturally, the next step is uh, we want to run uh, Doom on it. Um, so <laughs> let's uh, let's see how this uh, is done in this uh, next demo. Okay, so on the left we have uh, the hacker terminal. Um, on the bottom left we'll see the uh, audio recording uh, of whatever the hacker um, is recording on the phone. Um, there is a phone call taking place, or is this, there is something to record, and then the attack starts. Um, we send this unicast exploit in this example, uh, and we can also see that the, that the attacker is able to blink the LEDs and record the, the ongoing call, uploaded back to his machine, um, and then he, we, we will see that he is able to listen in on, on the conversation. And uh, now the fun part, so we, we take over the screen of the device, we upload Doom to it, uh, and we start the Doom game. 
and now we can see uh, the skills of whatever whoever is playing Doom here. Not bad. Um, okay, and lastly, we can see that sending this broadcast CDP packet uh, will crash all of these devices simultaneously. Uh, we didn't show those here, but um, uh, using the same exploit that we started with, we can also do this uh, broadcast ASLR bypass and take, take over all of these VoIPs uh, simultaneously. Okay. Um, so, another thing to note that um, a couple of months after we, p we published uh, this research, uh, there were a few other um, CVs that were discovered in CDP. Uh, and this is something that uh, happens uh, from time to time. One researcher comes in, finds vulnerabilities, and this uh, marks the way to other researchers. There is a potential here for vulnerabilities. Um, and so we, this, is, this brings us to um, the takeaways from this talk that the purpose of this research, as I, as I said in the beginning, was to tackle network segmentation. And as we saw, uh, it isn't bulletproof. Uh, vulnerabilities can be found in it. We found five of these, and then four more were found a couple of months later in CDP. And the attack surface is quite large, so there may be other vulnerabilities that exist here. Um, second, um, layer, two layer two protocols are an, an untapped attack surface. The fact that we found five vulnerabilities um, and then four more were found a couple of months later, it seems that this attack surface is ri ripe and there are um, other vulnerabilities that may be found here. Um, third thing is what we saw in PolyWAP. ASLR is not uh, perfect when it comes to 32 bit uh, Linux. And so even when mitigations are used, you should use them in the correct way or uh, in a very hardened way. Um, and lastly, but most importantly, uh, running Doom on a Cisco VoIP is probably the best use of a conference room, and we really recommend it. Uh, and we some have some time for questions now, and uh, we'd be happy to, to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs>